So, yeah, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Hannes, for, for doing the moderation. Until, I think, two days ago, we didn't have a moderator, so it's nice that you volunteer. Um, yeah, welcome to the first lightning talk of the 24th Chaos Communication Congress. My name is Oliver. I am one of the volunteers making the Congress Radio Project. The Congress Radio Project has quite a history on the Congress since the 19th uh, Congress. We are doing a radio station, normally FM. So UKW in German, uh, we started in the Haus am Kölnischen Park and then when the Congress moved here, we moved also. We had uh, several local radio stations at the last Congress, but uh, two years ago the media body of Berlin Brandenburg, the Medienanstalt Berlin Brandenburg, took away all the free license, uh, FM license or all the free frequencies. So uh, we, uh, yeah, we had no broadcast uh, anymore, so we uh, went to podcasting and to uh, a distribution portal in the internet from the Federal Association of Free Radios in Germany. Um, the internet address is uh, freie-radios.net. Uh, you can find it in Google if you're looking for freeradios.net or stuff like that. should be pop up as soon. Um, there we publish our um, podcasts or radio interviews and other free radio stations can take these transmissions and use them, use them in their own um, radio programs. And uh, I'm here today because I want to ask you if somebody wants to join our team, if somebody wants to do interviews, if somebody wants to uh, yeah, do podcasting or blogging, then you can call us. The deck number is 1234, yes, 1234 as uh, count to four. And we are located in the C level at the room C8282. So it's on the side facing the shopping mall. So you always find somebody sitting there cutting audio files and stuff like that. Um, the second lightning talk is, uh, should be about Gapminder. I wanted to show you, which is not working now, a website by a Swedish professor, Hans Rosling. I was uh, introduced to Hans Rosling uh, watching TED videos that is a conference in California every year. The thousand most important people are invited to this conference. And Hans Rosling is a Swedish professor of public health. And he invented the software to make statistical data visual. So statistical data is normally boring. It's Excel uh, sheets, uh, not very compelling, not very interesting. And he, with his student, developed a visualization software, which was acquired by Google in 2006. So you just go on gapminder.org, uh, look for the Gapminder world chart, and you can see, which I cannot show now, is um, a new kind of uh, presentation, and will, it will change your view, the view of the world. It's an interactive program that displays different statistical data from public founded uh, databases in a new dynamic way. Um, you can see the world as it is today, look back in time, and watch countries develop using over 40 variables. And it's a very new map of the world. It's not a developed world against undeveloped world or developing countries. It's not west against east. It's not north against south. It makes the view of the world, which you have today, completely ridiculous and completely wrong. Uh, you, can, you can see different countries um, completely uh, the other way as you did before. Um, each country is a circle on the chart, and instead of north and south, there's a level of health or, globe or income or child mortality or child per woman. And instead of east and west, there's amount of money or gross income or stuff like that. And um, this is on the axis on the left and the other is on, uh, on the bottom. And each country is a circle on the chart, and the color of the country depends on the country's region. So Hans Rosling divided the countries in uh, the two Americas, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in North uh, Sahara Africa, which means the Islamic uh, countries of Africa and the Arab states, uh, Europe and Russia, uh, South Asia and Asia. So they have different colors, red, blue, yellow, and stuff like that. And if you click on the, on, on, uh, on the global map, then you see all the countries, all the blue, all the circles, of the same color appear, so you can see them immediately, or if you click on one circle, you see on the global map on the other side 
um, you can see on the global chart the continent, uh, the place where the country is supposed to be. And the size of the circle depends on the population. So China is the most the biggest circle on that, uh, on that chart. And countries like, I don't know, Sierra Leone or uh, small countries, Andorra, they are almost invisible until you zoom in. Um, the name of, on the, of the country appears when you point on the, uh, point on the circle. Okay, just look at the website, you will find uh, Gapminder there. It's based on the Trent Eliza software, which was acquired by Google, as I said. Uh, how many, wie viel Zeit habe ich noch? Okay, the last two minutes, uh, I will just mention Dollar Street. It's another uh, software project by Hans Rosling and his team. Uh, I think it's, t until now it's Windows only software, so you have to install it on a Windows uh, virtual machine or something like that. Nobody has Windows installed, I know. Um, Dollar Street is a program where you see um, all people of the world live on one street, the Dollar Street. Um, the poorest live on the left side and the richest live on the right side. Everybody else lives in between, these poor and the richest. Dollar Streets contains complete photo panoramas from households at different income levels. So students and people went to the world and took pictures of uh, living rooms, uh, toilets, kitchens and stuff like that of different income levels, of families of different income levels. And the current version includes 13 households and three school documentations from Mozambique, South Africa and Uganda. And you scroll on the dollar street, on the software, from the left to the right, move up and down so you can pan into the pictures. And you can select, I mean, the people of IKEA ask the professor, show us the sofas, because we sell sofas. So he showed them the sofas of different income levels, so $1 a day, $10 a day, $50 a day, so how the income uh, develops. And yeah, try that, try Dollar Street, try Gapmanda, and if you uh, want to join the Congress Radio team, you're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Oliver. So the next would be Matt Edman. Is he around? No? Okay, then maybe Sunday. Then Mattes Mansell. Is he around? Just arrived. Oh, just arrived. So we will do that uh, not now, but in five minutes. So, Seatna, free geodata. Yeah. Welcome, Seatna, about free geodata and geo projects. This talk is in German. Internet habe ich da vorne gerade nicht. Nein, ich habe da gerade Das ist echt so, die brauchen ein Fußgänger. Hm? Brauchen Fußgänger. Ah, egal, meistens. Also Control L. Also Apfel L. Ich mache einfach meist so ohne Fußgänger. So. Okay, ähm, zwei Geodaten auf Deutsch. Oh, okay. Ähm, Ja, es, es bringt aber nichts, weil dann zeigt man es nur hier an. Ich brauche es ich brauch aber hier einfach mal so. Genau. Ähm, so. Also ich habe da vorne gerade kein Internet. Okay. Das ist so. Nee, das ist meine Rechnung. Würde ja auch gehen, aber egal, mach mal so. Also, freie Geodaten. Nein, ich habe da kein Internet. Ja, keine ähm, die ganzen Links hier drin, es wird eine kleine Übersicht. Die ganzen Links sollten alle äh, hier auf der Wiki-Seite stehen. Im Wiki unter freie Geodaten. Hier ein kleiner Screenshot. Ähm, ähm, hauptsächlich, ich komme aus, äh, aus OpenStreetMap, ähm, ja, ähm, Projekt und ähm, es geht aber nicht hier nicht um OpenStreetMap, sieht übrigens so aus, sondern ähm, 
Und die haben auch nicht den Editor, nennt sich Jossen, sieht so aus, sondern es geht eigentlich mehr um die Informationsquellen. Wer was über Steam, Open Streamer wissen möchte, ähm, morgen, Saal 3, 21.45, Frederik, der diesen äh, Jossen Editor maintained, hält einen Vortrag darüber. Äh, es gibt dann ein anderes Projekt, das nennt sich Open Aerial Map, ist im Prinzip dasselbe wie Open Street Map, nur halt mit Bildern. Das heißt, jeder kann Bilder hochladen oder wenn zum Beispiel jemand so eine Microdrone oder sowas hat und äh, irgendein Skript hat, das dann irgendwie eine Städte, Städte automatisch abfliegt und ein Bild draus macht, kann das hier hochladen und wird dann auch wieder mit den Open Street Map Daten kombiniert und dann haben wir hier auch sowas wie Google Maps nur halt frei und jeder kann es verwenden, wie er möchte. Außerdem gibt es geonames.org, die haben einfach ähm, ganz viele Geodaten, was es hier so gibt, ähm, zusammengefasst und in eine schöne GUI reingeschmissen und eine schöne, API dazu, äh, eine schöne GUI dazu baut. Äh, man kann hier alles bearbeiten, ist JavaScript-mäßig, also im Prinzip wirklich für Geodaten, basiert halt auf äh, Google Maps. Was dann auch wieder Probleme bringt mit, ähm, okay, wenn ich jetzt die Layer einblende, dann kann ich ja einfach äh, die, die Marke so hinsetzen und kopiere sozusagen fast wieder das Zeug von ähm, Google Maps, aber das ist ein schwieriges Thema. Wenn wir schon dabei waren, Google Maps, gibt es natürlich auch eine API, Ganze gibt es natürlich auch im Frei, wenn sich dann Open Layers, die sind eigentlich unabhängig vom Open äh, Street Map Projekt, aber wird halt von denen benutzt. Ähm, ganz wichtig, die Doku anschauen, wenn man sich damit beschäftigt und vor allem die Beispiele. Die sind nicht so gut verlinkt, da wird schon sehr viel erklärt drin. Die Links dazu alle auf der Wiki-Seite. Dann ähm, eine große Quelle sind dann noch Geodaten aus den USA, weil es gibt ja da irgendwie so vom, äh, vom Copyright-Gesetz her äh, ist es so, dass äh, Geodaten, in, was alles von Bundesmitarbeitern erfasst wird, muss frei sein. Ähm, sind zum Beispiel die SRTM-Daten, es gibt auch ganz viele äh, auch Luftbilder, wo ich frei muss ich bin. Die SMTM-Daten sind Höhendaten, hier gibt es eine schöne Demo dazu und äh, hier zum Beispiel Teigedaten, Straßen, die werden dann importiert, zum Beispiel momentan in OpenStreetMap, sieht momentan so aus, man sieht, imported, nicht importiert. Dann gibt es Webmap-Services, das bieten unter anderem, also im Prinzip funktioniert es wie über HTTP, man kann sich zum Beispiel anzeigen, was, was bietet alles an. Dann ähm, hier äh, kann man so einen Teil abfragen, sieht man ja, man gibt im Prinzip an, wie groß soll das Ding sein, also 300 mal 300 Pixel, welche Projektion. Das ist ein ganzes Thema, aber wir kommen jetzt mal dazu. Und hier unten gibt man dann an, in welchen Koordinaten, also links oben, rechts unten und welches Format. Und dann bekommt man einfach über HTTP ein Bild. Und das gibt es halt dann von den Vermessungsämtern zum Beispiel. Wenn man sich die Konfigurationsdatei mal anschaut, sieht man hier für jedes Bundesland ein. Und die kann man eigentlich mit jeder Software, was man so hat, was WMS kann, abrufen. Projekt, Problem sind dann nur die, noch die Projektionen. Okay. Das wäre es einfach. Falls jemand Fragen hat, anrufen, E-Mail schreiben, Jabber. Dankeschön. Willst du jetzt einen Vortrag halten ohne Internet oder willst du es noch schnell auf dem USB-Stick kopieren, irgendwas? Kann das anzeigen? Da. Ja, nein? Hm? Okay. Okay, the next is uh, Matt eben, uh, Mattes Menzel about Wikinet. Wikinet. Unfortunately, I can show no, uh, no web pages, so I have to talk like that. There are 29 wiki hives. A wiki hive means you can create a new wiki with a click. No silly questions like, what is your wiki about? And uh, I made a wiki, the hive wiki, f uh, gathering all these uh, different wiki hives. Cool. <clears throat> the communication among these wiki hives and the wiki sitting in them is painfully poor. Mostly they don't even know about each other. That's not cool, nor wiki. For connecting wiki communities, it would take certain interfaces to the public for each wiki, I thought. We should put out RSS feeds so every wiki can include interface pages of neighboring wikis locally. For example, wikis should have a face telling about what's going on in the community. The page Wikinet Faces, as its counterpart, shows the faces of wikis in the neighborhood and the local face of the wiki. Every wiki community chooses its own neighborhood. That's very important. 
I made up several such interfaces to the public, starting with single wikis, then gathering wikis of a certain context in center wikis. Recently, I connected some wiki hives, wiki hosting places. The wiki hive lists of a wiki hive lists all living wikis in it. The page wikinet hive lists lists all the wikis in the neighboring wiki hives. I'm sorry, I can't show anything. I wish it would be easy for a wiki community to connect to other communities, having information about them locally and updated automatically. That's the idea behind it. All it takes is each community to care for its face and a couple of other local pages for communicating to the public. I even wish it would be easy for a wiki to move physically closer to its neighborhood by migrating to another more adequate wiki hive and thus enabling the conglomeration of collective intelligence. Wikis are nomads. That's an important sentence there. A center wiki is a common platform for a certain type of wiki. For example, all wikis in a wiki hive using Germans are gathered in a wiki centrum for the wiki hive. But center wikis, gathering wikis from different wiki hives are just as well possible. For example, a city wiki center or a political wiki center. Each wiki has a home page in the center wiki, including basic, in, basic information about it and including the recent changes on the bottom of the wiki. The center wiki runs a wiki list linking to the home pages of the single wikis. And when a wiki has a home page in the wiki center, the wiki list of the center wiki is included into the wiki node of the wiki. That results in a local and automatically updating list of likely neighboring wikis. And it is only one, in words one, click to see each wiki's recent changes on the bottom of the home page. I think it's a little sad to see, col to see competitiveness among different wiki hives, which all hosts wikis, which are basically collaborative. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks. The next talk is by Ricardo Christoph Remenfortes about AK Forward and on the go current projects and plans. Wrong password, sorry. Well, hi, I'm Christoph from the uh, AK Vorrat, the German working group on data retention. Um, we have a desk uh, right here at the corner near the FFII. Um, desk where you see the big transparent with uh, Mr. Schäuble on it. I would like to talk about the next uh, goals, the next projects we will do. Um, maybe you heard we are filing a constitutional complaint against uh, the data retention law which will be adopted in uh, January the 1st. We will find this complaint within the next days. We have, we have reached about, well, between 25,000, 30,000 participants with this complaint, which is an, an absolute world record. <laughs> um, we plan to do a press conference on Saturday. We have to think about that and to, to work about that, but we plan to do it here on the, con on the Congress. And... Uh, but uh, that, that's for, for experts. If you want to join the press team, please uh, come to our desk. Um, but there are other projects and other topics, other tasks we have to do. Um, the next is the demonstration in Hamburg on uh, December the 31st. Uh, if you come from Hamburg, please join us. Please uh, come to our informational desk. We will give you the information where to find it. 
we hope to uh, see some thousand people there. Um, then there will be a demonstration in Munich at uh, January the, the 6th and um, should be also very large. If you come from uh, Bayuvaria, um, please join it. But we, we have a, lo a lot of work to do. The constitutional complaint is not the, uh, not the end of our race, not the end of our work. We will therefore uh, invite to a strategy congress um, during February the 8th to February the 10th, uh, which will be held in Kassel. Um, we will invite uh, all NGOs dealing with um, yeah, privacy, uh, human rights, uh, civil rights, uh, also the parties, of course, and uh, the activists uh, throughout Germany. If you want to join, please uh, come to our informational desk. Um, the goal of this uh, strategy congress um, is mainly well, developing, developing uh, strategies for getting into the uh, stakeholders, groups, uh, forcing strategies of lobbying, civil society lobbying, civil um, rights lobbying, and force the networking of uh, the civil society in general. Um, so that's a very important thing we have to work about because the, the problem at, at present is that a lot of NGOs are working separately, they are not connected very good. Well, we plan, of course, the next large uh, demonstration in Germany. We do not have a date for that, but it will be about, well, I hope 50,000 participants. It depends on you. Um, we need uh, more activists, we need volunteers, we need uh, people who work and spare some time, some hours uh, a month uh, to bring this movement uh, further. If you want to join us, please come to our informational desk and we have also a DECT, which is uh, 25, uh, well, 2584. Uh, we will be here and we will answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much. The next talk is uh, number 32. It's done by FUBATS about uh, EU telecom payers. He has only time today and he is... Um, yeah, I, I keep it. I keep it very short. Um, we have. Uh, we have a net here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm based in Brussels. I'm working on many EU projects, um, especially in the area of open standards right now. And um, I, I also was involved in data retention. And we know that this data retention movement is now very big in Germany. We have demonstrations. We have the constitutional complaint here in Germany, which I find very interesting, but I have no time to deal with it anymore. But in Brussels, it was like, like 10 people working half-time on, on the project, and we, we just lacked people in Brussels working on it with Parliament and, and so on. So um, I came across uh, something I think we can reverse or at least change the direction of the data retention directive um, by a current project, and this is... Um, the Generaldirektion Informationsgesellschaft, DG InfoSoc, uh, Direktorat General, they proposed a telecom package, telecommunication regulation. It's three directives, and these three directives are extremely obfuscated and change several other directives. So nobody really knows and understands these directives, and they create a new telecom your regulation authority that should be independent from politics. And what I found out is, um, just by analyzing the telecom directive, just a bit, I don't have much time for it, um, that this one of these directives changes the same directive that was changed by the data retention directive, which was also a directive that changed another directive. So this directive now is a channel to reverse the effects of the data retention directive, and we can use it. Just someone needs to work on it, provide a consolidated version what actually this uh, directive does. Um, I created a wiki page. I can invite you to this uh, wiki page. Yeah. Let's. Okay. Uh. Um. 
so this is uh, the web address where I, where I put it. Uh, it's uh, telcompackage.wiki.com. And uh, there I assembled all the different directives, um, what, what, uh, what directives will get amended by this especially very obfuscated piece of legislation. What I need are people who are interested to work on it, to analyze it, to find out what it really does, what are the pitfalls, and uh, provide some input for parliamentarians. And I'm pretty sure that MEPs, members of the parliament, will be extremely helpful, uh, extremely amazed if you provide input to them because they will hate this telecom package because it's so obfuscated and nobody really knows what it does and their assistants also need to work on it. There are no rapporteurs assigned yet, people in the parliament committee that are responsible for it, but each of these directives will go to about six, uh, six committees. So you really have an opportunity, if you really want a change, get applied. You try it in each of these committees uh, you just need one MEP to table your change proposal and maybe it gets accepted by the one committee, maybe by the other, and then some, some other uh, members of the committee will provide their own change proposals. So um, I think it's an extremely interesting opportunity and there are also some, some other pitfalls probably in this directive. I think uh, in this directive package, I think it's pretty evil and we don't understand it yet. So we need your help to, to analyze it and yeah. Or maybe if you have a sponsor, I can, I can employ some, some guys who work on it. Yeah, so thank you. Okay, thanks. The next talk is by Thomas Rössler. Uh, Rössler about when witches go bad. Uh, hello, I'm Thomas. I'm an Apple user. I would like to introduce you to a species of software that I believe... Hello? Oh, please. What's this? How do I move on to the next slide? Ah, very well. Thank you. No. No, sorry. Okay. We can add that to my time. I would like to introduce you to a species of software that you haven't paid enough attention to, and indeed we will go out of this. Chris, Chris Leopard. Um, I want to introduce you to a species of software that you haven't paid a lot of attention to, and that's all, this, all these nifty little widgets running in the Apple dashboard. A widget is a little helper. It's a little helper that often provides an interface to some Web 2.0 website. By definition, it is therefore cool. It is also very easy to install, just one click. In particular, if you're using Safari, it all feels safe. It's easy to install. It's easy to program this stuff because you actually all know the programming environment that these beasts live in. That programming environment is HTML and CSS for the user interface, and it is JavaScript for the behavior. Uh, well, it's almost the environment you know from the web because widgets have a little bit of additional power. For example, you have a widget.system method, which is indeed precisely the same thing as system3 on a traditional Unix C library. Or you can go out to the network, but without that pesky same origin policy. Speaking of going out to the network, I said a widget is often a front end for a Web 2.0 application. That means it needs to access some application's API. Cool APIs these days are built on top of JSON, the JavaScript object notation. That means you're sending JavaScript constant expressions over the wire, and as everything with widgets, these are easy to parse. Let me repeat that. You go out on the network with HTTP, you retrieve data, the data is code, you feed the code to eval in an environment where you have access to a system shell. I'm not even giving you the list of widgets that do that. There's many of them. But that's actually boring. The interface is HTML based. That means that if a widget takes data from the network and wants to tell you about these data, it needs to write that information to the document object model. Writing strings to the DOM and being sloppy about it is what we know as cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on websites. Well, 
no longer on websites. This is the Google Mail front end for the dashboard. They recently released a new version. What this beast did was it wrote stuff to the user interface by overwriting the inner HTML property. So you can put tags in there and all that funny stuff. And well, the stuff they wrote there came from an email's subject header. <laughs> this was enough to execute a shell on the affected computer. In short, widgets are easy to install, they're very easy to program. They include security critical code in JavaScript and they include tons of security critical bugs which are incredibly easy to exploit. Pay attention to them, enjoy them. If you want to talk more about it, see me in the break. Thank you. <laughs> okay, the next talk is about OpenXPK PKA update. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Alech. Uh, uh, I work at Synops, uh, a small network uh, security company uh, outside of Frankfurt. Uh, and I'd like to talk a bit about OpenXPKI again. Um, OpenXPKI um, is a PKI or Trust Center software project. Um, it's not the typical uh, PKI project that you have in, in the open source community because most of them are for the home installations. Uh, so that's a bit more business-like. Uh, when I say business, uh, well, that's what we learned from, from working in a PKI project uh, in a large financial institution. So basically the requirements come from there, talk to a lot of backend systems uh, and so on. Um, it's mostly written in, in Perl, uh, has some C code uh, to glue to OpenSSL. Um, basically there's an abstraction from the cryptographic library, so if you don't like OpenSSL, you, you can replace that. Um, and of course it is free software, uh, it comes uh, under an Apache license uh, and for the details uh, you can see the talk that I gave uh, at 23C3 uh, about it. Um, so all the details are in there. Uh, what I want to talk today about is a bit uh, what we did in 2007, so since the last time I talked about it. Um, one thing we did uh, pretty early in the year was we added uh, support for request tracker. Um, for those of you who don't know Request Tracker, it's a ticketing system also written in Perl. Uh, and it's pretty useful if, if you've got a large uh, business environment where if you've got lots of request supports regarding the certificate requests, then you can just do them using Request Tracker and Request Tracker can send, send out your email saying, your certificate is ready, you can download it here and there and you don't have to do that manually anymore. So that, that's pretty useful. Um, what we also did was uh, implement uh, approval with digital signatures. Um, that's pretty neat. You can use your browser uh, and approve the certificate requests using digital signatures. That both works on uh, Mozilla-based browsers uh, and uh, on IE as well. Um, also pretty nice if, you, if you've got lots of uh, users who don't exactly care about certificates, they just want their application to work, uh, is what we call a template-based certificate subject generation. Uh, that's basically the idea, uh, normally your PKI application asks your user, okay, uh, what subject of your certificate would you like to have? And then the user goes like, uh, subject, uh, well, what was that again? And how is it supposed to look like? And um, the idea is that you just you ask the user the information that he knows. Like you ask, okay, you've got that, you want to have that application for a TLS server. What is the host name of the server? What is the port of the server? and then the user inputs that data and you create um, your certificate subject based on, on a templating system. And that, that's pretty useful because then users don't mess up your uh, certificate naming conventions. Um, what we also did uh, was introduce a configuration versioning. So we've got uh, something called workflows uh, that start at some time and then they run and at some time they are finished. And if you want to uh, change the configuration in between, uh, that's pretty tricky because it might change the way uh, your workflow is actually running. Uh, think of the workflow as a state machine. 
Um, so you, you can't exactly do that when there are workflows in progress. So what we did is the workflows start with their configuration uh, and they run with the configuration they started with. And uh, at any time if you change um, the configuration, it it's only valid for the new workflows that are created, which is a pretty neat thing, I think, as well. So you can keep your uh, system running and update the configuration and it only affects the things that you create newly on the system. Um, we recently also released uh, a first live CD version because the installation depends on well, half of CPAN probably. So it's a bit of a, a dependency how to actually install OpenX PKI. So if you want to give it a, a quick test write, you can use the live CD uh, for that. Um, that. That's pretty nice. And uh, if, you, if you don't care about PKI, um, well, something you could look into as well is Morphix. Uh, I was pretty amazed how easy it is to create live CDs using Morphix. Uh, that's pretty nice. You can build Debian uh, based live CDs uh, just using an XML configuration file and one command say, okay, g give me an ISO. That, that's pretty cool. And what will be new in 2008? Uh, well, we're planning to create a new live CD or that is actually nearly finished, uh, just not uploaded yet. Um, it will come with a persistent storage support, so you can actually uh, run your small PKI. I, I wouldn't recommend that for a real productive environment, but for, for trying it out at home or for running your home PKI, you can do that from the CD, uh, just use a USB stick as the, the medium for your uh, CA key uh, and your database that will be on the CD, and you, you can do that uh, pretty much from the OpenX PKI Live CD, which will be released uh, in, in early January. Uh, we will hopefully have a stable release uh, sometime soon. Uh, we'll have more documentation. Um, th that's a promise. Uh, hold me to that. And we will have some more productive installations. Uh, we've got some, some customers who want to switch over from OpenCA, which is the, the predecessor project. Uh, if you want to talk about OpenX PKI or PKI in general, uh, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, talk to me when you see me. I'm Alech. Um, unluckily, I forgot my deck at home, so you will have to email me if you, if you want to catch me. Uh, our webpage is uh, openxpki.org, and uh, those two are the mailing list uh, where the communication regarding the project takes place. Thanks. Okay, thank you. The next one is uh, Serna again with uh, Wikipedia Project Vorlagenauswertung. Okay, also dieses Mal über Wikipedia Projekt Vorlagenauswertung. Es kommt daher, es gibt ja in Wikipedia. Es gibt ja in Wikipedia diese Vorlagen, die man recht leicht einbinden kann, zum Beispiel zum Beispiel bei äh, Tieren, Elefanten, Städten, einfach um äh, ähm, Informationen, die es bei jedem, ähm, bei jedem Artikel irgendwie aus einer Gruppe äh, gibt, die oft nicht darzustellen, ähm, wie gesagt hier beim Elefanten. Und ähm, das Wikipedia-Projekt Vorlagenauswertung kommt daher, es gab so ein Template, mit dem man hier Koordinaten einbinden konnte. Und da hat sich jemand gedacht, okay, das können wir doch mit Google, äh, Google Earth, Google Maps oder so auch noch ein bisschen schön auf eine Karte darstellen oder so. Und hat dann ähm, ein Perl-Script oder sowas geschrieben, dass die ganzen Dinge, äh, das einfach einen Dump nimmt und diese Koordinaten rausholt und nicht in eine Datenbank schmeißt. Ähm, dürfte ja mal einigen bekannt sein. Und dann haben sie es noch ein bisschen erweitert, dass es eben mit allen Vorlagen geht. Das heißt, man kann dann zum Beispiel für Personen, alle Personen, die, in, die mir so und so anfangen, bitte auflisten. Oder ähm, meinetwegen, der, der da geboren ist und, da, und dann und dann gestorben ist, der soll jetzt auf der Liste aufschauen. Wie man sieht, äh, ist momentan recht langsam, hat den Sinn, weil das Ganze alles in einer Datenbank drin steckt. Das heißt, ähm, das, hier ist, ist jeweils, das hier ist jeweils ein Datenbankeinsatz, bei dem nicht, nicht einmal IDs verwendet werden, sondern einfach Namen, Strings. Das heißt, wie oft da Vorlage Personendaten drin steht, kann man sich ja ausdenken. Und Ziel, was ich jetzt ein bisschen bewirken will, oder 
ein paar, dass sich das ein paar Leute anschauen und vielleicht auch Lust haben, das ähm, ein bisschen zu optimieren. Zum einen Beispiel wäre, zum, äh, wär, ähm, dass man also extra Tabellen macht mit IDs. Ähm, man, man kann sich das auch, es fand auch schon ein bisschen Diskussion statt. Also wer möchte, kann sich das mal durchlesen und man kann dann auch solche Sachen wie zum Beispiel äh, einfache Queries ähm, direkt umbauen in die komplizierteren. Also Beispiel wäre jetzt hier. Du, du, du. Wie viel Zeit habe ich noch? Das war jetzt so schnell. Oder anderthalb. Ja, okay. Ähm, dann zeige ich noch schnell das Tabellenlayout. Also das sind die Tabellen, was es momentan gibt. Beziehungsweise, nee. Hier. Man sieht einfach überall Strings, Strings. Und das ist langsam, ist, ist klar. Und die Idee dahinter, das umzusetzen, wäre dann zum Beispiel äh, hier, dass man einfach mit IDs baut. Und das dann alles schön miteinander ableitet und dann zum Beispiel auch solche Dinge macht, wie wenn ich sage, okay, Select Name, Geburtsdatum, From Person, Like Name, also alles, was mit End anfängt, das dann irgendwie in, was in das die komplizierte Variante umbaut und das Ganze auch für End-User, beziehungsweise einfach Leute, die sich mit SQL ein bisschen auskennen, zugänglich macht und nicht die komplizierten Queries, wie man sie gerade oben dran stehen hatten, braucht und dann auch schöne Abfragen machen kann. Das wäre es eigentlich soweit. Okay, the next speaker is Julian Todd about uh, undem undemocracy.com. Show up, yes. Hello? Hello? Mm -hmm. I want to know what to speak about. Yeah. Oh, no. Spam. Shit. What's the PDF version? I have a PDF version there. I can grab it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ricardo? Around? Can you just jump in about Tor? So we need to copy a PDF version of it. Thank you. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, seems like I've been here before. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I will take it in my hands. Thank you. Um, oh, well, I was just uh, chatting around. Uh, sorry, I have to find my notes. There are. Okay, I would like to talk about um, Tor. Um, well, actually, I'm not a technician. I do not know anything about the techniques uh, behind it. But I believe that uh, Tor is a way uh, providing privacy to the masses, um, providing privacy for political activists, not only in Germany or Europe, but also in the third world. And therefore, I believe that uh, the Tor network is a very important network, and we have to support it. Uh, that's why several people thought about bringing different ideas together um, and these ideas contain, um, not excluding, but uh, building up a network of NGOs and foundations uh, running Tor servers, uh, Tor exit nodes, to um, catch the liability issues which we have in Germany. In Germany, the uh, running of Tor servers may be, um, uh, the, the admins of Tor servers may be forced to store data, um, uh, telecommunications data, uh, when the data retention law gets um, into effect. So we try to, to uh, build up foundations who, well, technically run the Tor servers um, and catch the liability issue. The other idea I heard about that Roger Dingeldein, who is here, I would like to meet you <laughs> um, the next hours, um, 
was thinking about a kind of uh, Tor web of trust. So um, excluding all the NSA-driven and CIA-driven uh, Tor nodes, um, build up a, a, a Tor web of trust. That's a good idea, I think. Then there's another issue which is um, very important for Tor admins. Uh, it is building up a network of NGOs and foundations providing legal aid for Tor admins in uh, Germany and Europe. Uh, yesterday, we founded a new uh, foundation about that, <laughs> and we will uh, try to, to um, provide legal aid for Tor server admins. Then there's another project which is a little bit technical, maybe it's more uh, interesting for you. Um, we try to develop um, uh, the, the guys from Freifunk, which you can find uh, upstairs, um, try to develop um, an interface, an easy to use interface for dummies uh, running Tor as an exit node on their um, wireless LAN router, which uh, will contain only five options. Uh, which is Tor on and off, um, wireless LAN on and off, and expert options. <laughs> Usually the dummy just needs uh, the, the, the four options on and off. Yeah. So, and th there's a long uh, running goal um, which will, be not, will not be reached uh, within the next uh, days or weeks, but we try to develop um, some kind of pre-configured uh, wireless LAN router, which should be very um, cheap and uh, very easy to, to use for dummies. Um, we try to build that together with the Freifunk community and um, we will try to compete phone, uh, Phonera, with that. Uh, if you would like to join that, if you have technical abilities, uh, please come to the informational desk of the Akafora shrine right at the corner or to the Freifunk community uh, on level C. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So now we have Julian Todd on about undemocracy.com. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Okay, the Whoop. it'll come eventually. Okay, the yeah, okay. Yes. Slideshow up top. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the UN stands for uh, United Nations and uh, 3 years ago I hacked the uh, United Kingdom Parliament and la this year I've been hacking uh, the United Nations to see what, what documents I can pull out of there. Now, the United Nations was set up to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And uh, here we are three generations later and we've got a war and it didn't save us from it. And the United Nations has a website for Iraq and uh, uh, doesn't tell us how it didn't save us from the war because it doesn't go for before 2003. Now, if you know exactly where to look, you can, and I'd, I'd buy a beer for anyone who can find this document, this one, uh, Security Council Resolution 1441, which was in 2002, if anyone remembers this. Um, if you do uh, uh, find this, uh, you won't be able to show anyone else because the URL uh, that, they, that they link to you doesn't work for you. Um, it has uh, uh, referring blocks and the URL is randomized. So uh, I can find it, but no one else can find it. So the solution is you first uh, download every document you can find on it and rehost it under uh, a proper URL where you put it on your own website and you give it the correct URL with something that matches the document ID, S for Security Council Resolution 1441. And then you can read how the war began. Um, so this is what one of those meetings looks like in the Security Council, and what I was showing was uh, one of their 
judgments, their international law from it. Um, next door to this room, they have uh, this other strange room where they also have meetings where all the countries speak and they all vote and no one ever finds out what they are because the transcripts are, are, are also hidden from you unless you really know where to look. So this is what one of the transcripts looks like. Um, it, 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 they speak and occasionally your country will speak and you, you, you might find out what's happening then. Um, uh, but this is a PDF file, so there's not much you can do with it, except you can convert it into uh, uh, XY coordinates for each word. And uh, if you do a lot of work, you can recreate this into structured HTML and uh, put this into a database or a front-end website, which is uh, much easier to read. You can search, you can link to it. So, for example, because they block the documents, uh, you'll never find a, a United Nations document on Google if you, use that, if you use that search engine, and their search engine doesn't work. This is a short debate they had uh, a few years ago about a war that ended in, two, in 1982. Uh, they have all kinds of jokes, if you ever find out. Um, this was the front page of the website that I was producing. Um, which has recent meetings from Security Council. Uh, uh, now it's got the one from Benazir Bhutto. There was a meeting just yesterday, and it's already, already been parsed and processed. Um, then there's a General Assembly, which no one knows about. And finally, uh, I've been uh, putting links from Wikipedia articles into these formerly unreferenceable, unlinkable documents, uh, which you can see going through uh, there. Now, uh, this is, for example, one such article where uh, this Polish general got hurt in a bomb uh, a few months ago, and there was a Security Council meeting about it. And so we can link to it, and you can read the meeting. There are a lot of important things that they don't have a meeting about. For example, they'll never meet about Fallujah or, or any, any more important issues. Um, OK, but the problem is that uh, there hasn't been enough interest in it. Um, the difficult problem of the PDF to structured HTML is done, and I would uh, like anyone else who could take uh, over the website and uh, take all the credit if they want to, that's no problem. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, the last talk will be by um, Tomasz Wigdronowski about uh, cross-site scripting protection for Ruby on Rails. Mm. Oh, well. Oops. Okay, basically Ruby on Rails is the most popular uh, framework for Web 2.0 and the biggest problem with it is that it wasn't written with security in mind. So basically uh, you have to take care of security when you're coding Rails. And one particular nasty problem is that in Ruby on Rails views uh, it's very easy to make a silly mistake that will end up with your application being uh, vulnerable to cross-site scripting requests. Uh, vulnerabilities. Basically, every single string ever in any view, and in application uh, there are usually more view code lines than normal code lines, if you miss any age, you end up with a potential vulnerability. And it's very, very easy. So I think that every single Rails application ever has this kind of vulnerabilities. So we developed a very simple plugin which pretty much deals with all of them, fixes all of them. And this doesn't really, doesn't only apply to uh, array HTML. If you use an alternative uh, template engine like, let's say, Haml, you still have the identical problem. So it's not about array HTML, it's about Ruby and Rails views in general. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, basically, every the problem is that you cannot escape everything. You only you sh you must escape some things, those that are shown in red, and you must not escape things that are shown in blue because they generate HTML code. So if you have like link two, then you must not escape it. On the other hand, when you have like things in red that are not uh, HTML, you must escape it. So it's very easy to make a mistake. 
but there's a pattern where which things should be escaped and which should be not. So if something is a st normal string, it in 99% of cases should be escaped. On the other hand, if something is an output of a helper like link to, in well 100% of cases it should not be escaped. And this pattern is actually so so simple that a simple plugin can handle all your XSS problems. Uh, okay. Oops. Max. I really, really hate Max. Okay, basically the idea is to have two classes, the normal string that is shown in red here, and the safe string which is a subclass of string which is shown in green. And when uh, in a view you have a red string, it will be automatically escaped, and if you have a green string, it will not be escaped. And basically everything in, uh, everything will handle uh, the colors correctly. So, we have uh, basic operations like H, which does HTML escaping, and if you explicitly HTML escape something, it will, of course will be green then, and it won't be escaped again. You have a uh, magic method to S XSS protected, which is called by uh, the view engine, which if something is red, it will be escaped. If something is green, it will be just kept like it was. And if something is not a string, it will be uh, converted to a string and then HTML escaped. So this is what the view engine uses. And there's a third method which actually marks something explicitly as XSS protected. And this is used by helpers uh, to mark their outputs as green. So it won't be escaped. So uh, just providing the plugin with a list of helpers that you trust and handling the few special cases where you generate HTML manually uh, by a few MAGAS XSS protected and age and so on. So by very, very little code, you completely get rid of all XSS problems in your Ruben Rails applications. So all your views are completely safe. You do not have to worry about XSS when you're doing views. You have to worry about XSS when you're doing helpers, but this is just like 100 times less code than all the views. And this is uh, available on, on Google Code since last week, and I think this is a really, really great plugin. Yeah, thanks a lot to all the speakers and all the public. Um, so see you on Sunday for the other session of Lightning Talks. If you are interested to give a Lightning Talk, just add it to the wiki. <laughs>